We will dive into 3D printing in relation to the arts uh, soon, but I, I would like to start out at a higher level. Um, I'll address this question to Adam. Adam, how would you say the arts community adjusted to the digital age as opposed to, in comparison to some other industries? Yeah, well, I, you know, first it's difficult to generalize, um, but I'll, I'll generalize. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, so I think you have to make a distinction, right, between sort of individual independent artists and the uh, arts institutions, um, and and arts institutions, and also sort of corporate media, really, because you might want to put that under the same umbrella. Sort of big bureaucratic entities that are in the arts and media world versus um, independent actors, uh, and I, I think. Um, we've seen a real separation there, actually, and part of it has to do with, with technology. This is a great time um, to be an independent artist. Artists have, have really embraced everything that, that the internet has brought them from, you know, if you think about film editing equipment that would have cost you, you know, $20,000 in 1995, now comes for free on your phone. Or maybe you have to pay 99 cents for it in an app store or something, right? Uh, and there's a million examples like that. People are financing their work on Kickstarter, and you know they're they're getting rid of the the, uh, the intermediaries uh, of the you know, the gatekeepers of the 20th century, um, uh, which is really allowing you know millions of independent voices uh, to have a platform um, that wouldn't have been possible without all this tech. Uh, at the same time, um, you know I, I think the uh, sort of big arts, right, so symphony orchestras and ballet companies and, and museums to some extent, and, you know, you might also, also put, you know, Hollywood and, and the music industry under this umbrella. Um, I think they had a really hard time with it. Um, you know, you had people suing their customers, um, you've, got, you've got people, um, you know, kicking people out of theaters because they're tweeting about the show, even if they're saying positive things, they're going to sell more tickets. Um, so there's been a, a, a really... There have been a lot of challenges um, kind of wrapping their mind around the fact that technology is, whether you like it or not, changing the way that art is made, the way it's distributed, the way it's financed, the way it's consumed. And um, you can either work with it or um, you can get left behind. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're starting to turn the corner on that. But in general, um, those folks, as opposed to the independent artists, have, have not done a great job of giving up. We heard in uh, the most recent panel that there is a workforce skills gap that is plaguing thousands of workers in the nation and really affecting the manufacturing industry. Um, so off of that question that I just asked Adam, any of you can feel free to answer this. Um, you know, is there a skills gap when it comes to technology among artists in the arts community? Um, specific to 3D printing or not? Well, as we know, there's a wealth of information on the internet. You can how-to anything. Um, but in these applications, we're finding artists come to maker spaces so that they can pull for the knowledge as they need it. Um, if you have a project in mind or if you want to explore a medium, um, artists are coming to maker spaces where they can have access to technology. And it's not just about the machine, of course, uh, it all starts with design, learning design programming. I mean, start with a sketch and then you have to translate it and so this idea of having uh, access to testing out your ideas it may not be the final but the act of experimentation is is highly value, valuable I would say though there is a gap for I mean for a studio like ours where when we're trying to hire people there's a lot of people who might be willing to sketch an idea and then go through all the engineering work or contract engineers to, to execute something. What we don't find is people who think through the technology in a creative way. Right? I don't see people, or as many as I would like, that embrace it as a medium. Right? They, they're experimenting directly in that medium. Um, there's been more and more of that recently, but like, it's still not, it's not something you're tripping over. And I think finding people like that are still very, very hard to find. So what would you say separates the people who are like that from those who are not, from artists who are not embracing that technology? Is it a generational difference or is it a, an issue of perception um, within the community? I, mean, I, don't, I don't know what it is exactly. I find the people that end up fitting that profile have very diverse backgrounds. Like they're people that maybe just love too many things in their life and, and they have this like really amazing skill set, which is probably what an artist should be anyway. 
Um, but I find that there's a lot of them that do get siloed into these very specific disciplines, like I'm going to be a painter, or I'm going to be this, or even architects and designers, we find that like there are some certain schools or certain institutions that resist technology more than others. Um, and it, it comes from a kind of, what I've seen is in the academic world, in the arts, and in design, it comes from a kind of philosophical, sort of philosophically rooted methodology that they teach. Uh, rather than necessarily looking all the time at, at what's happening in the market and what people might be needing. Um, and I'm not saying that art has to do this, but I think design does. Um, and that would be my point of seeing and skills in hiring. Thank you. Kate, I think you had thoughts on this. Yeah, a couple of things. I think um, as, a, as a studio artist, the, what the skills gap for me, which there is, has allowed for is collaboration with 3D modelers and trying to get my ideas, which in itself has been really exciting as an artist because it brings you know two people into thinking about and solving problems in a way. I think in my own case it's generational, um, but with my students at RISD, they come with the knowledge of how to use 3D modeling software. They might not know the material that we're working with, but then it, again, it's also a collaboration because they're very comfortable designing things, but they need to know a little bit about what the material is. What we don't know, and I guess this is a bigger issue, is most artists, or even it is the programming. There's only certain things that you can do with the modeling software, but I guess eventually if artists were more involved with actually programming, um, that would help. If, and I'll address this to the group as well, if you had to name one obstacle that artists face in incorporating technology like 3D printing into their work, whether that's an internal or external obstacle, what do we think that is? I, I think it's an internal obstacle, um, and I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's one that not everyone faces, but, but a lot of artists I think still um, have this sort of mentality that is often instilled in, in a educational context um, where there's this belief that okay there's sort of artist as romantic other and all I have to do is be in my studio and do my art and, and if I think about commerce or technology or anything other than the craft and the, and the, the aesthetics that that's somehow impure um, and I think that's a, just a poisonous a terrible um, way to approach y your work um, certainly the people that we see succeed are the ones who don't have that kind of mentality who um, who are looking at their work holistically and in the context of, uh, in a social and an economic context, um, and a big part of that is technology. So they're willing to get their hands dirty. They don't see it as somehow beneath them or something that, you know, their agent should do for them or, or, or whatever, right? Um, it's, it's part of the work. Anyone else pulls up that from there? I feel like Phyllis does. I can sense it. Well, we exist outside the realm. I mean, there's a lot of fab labs in, in community colleges and universities, but for the most part, it's, it's not part of um, uh, a traditional structure. It's a place of invention, so you come. It's, it's individual driven. And so I, I shudder to try to generalize about artists, and I, I just think that having this as an external uh, condition. It's about having access. And if you provide, whether it be an, a hobbyist, a technologist, a musician, a fine artist, just having access to experiment with it, the, the current limitations are that at the consumer level, uh, 3D printing uh, is limited in size, although it's been hacked by jurists um, with uh, uh, Ultimaker, where he's created rails and turned it upside down and flipped the head and create huge things. Um, he is the ultimate artist hacker who is defying the limitations as we know it. Um, he's one example. But I think that, um, you know, right now 3D printing is limited in size, it's limited in materials, but there's many people working to get around that. We have some people in the audience who have created new 3D printers that people can build in a day. Um, there's people working on alternate materials. I mean, it gets boring if you're just working with PLS and, and ABS plastic. Uh, if you get to work in ceramic or glass, as they do at MIT, um, you know, you can think bigger about it. So 
part of it's the limitation of what's available, and then uh, part of it's up to the artist to, um, if they have the resources or the community, to start to adapt the machines and the technology for what they want to do. And so, if you think of it as self-driven, if you want to, if you conceived of something and you want to test it out, you're going to learn whatever you need to learn in order to, to make it happen and the maker spaces enable that. I wonder if any one of my panelists can give an example of um, a work or some sort of creative process that an artist would was empowered by 3D printing to make. It's something that could not have existed without 3D printing <coughs> comes to mind. I thought Kate maybe you might have some examples with your students. Well, again, it's it's we're working within this this design, ceramic design, and there are certain things that can be printed that can't be made any other way. Um, I think one of the issues, as far as is accessibility to artists, it's still an external thing. It's still a pretty expensive process. Um, it's not that available. So, I, but that's all going to change, and I think more people will have access to it. Um, but I think that comes to the point of approaching it for the things that it can do. And somebody said this in a panel before, it's just, it's a tool in the tool block box. And it's, right now there's a novelty to it and people want to do it, use it for everything. But I think where, where it's going to really move forward is we'll see what it can do specifically and uniquely that's going to move it forward. So is there, a percep is there a perception within the arts community that an artist who incorporates 3D printing is what, X, Y, Z? Is that, um, does that gain sort of more respect or is it perceived as, I don't want to say lazy, but a, a bit of a cop out it's because it's not that traditional art form? that depends on, again, on the person you're talking to. Some people feel that absolutely it comes from a tradition where you have to make everything by hand. And you have to be it's sort of a romantic notion because right. even artists that are painters could have 15 people working for them and painting for them. So what's the difference if they have some, you know, a horde of people <coughs> doing the work for them or, or a printer? But this was, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, that notion of the artist working on the studio wasn't even, it wasn't even true in the Renaissance. Right? I mean, like that they've had these sort of studio models where people can try to just work forever. I don't, I, you know, I mean, I always look at, I mean, we do sell some artworks, like it is, it is like it's about 20% of our revenue. And like, I gotta be honest with you, we look at it as a product, right? And like, if it's helping us make it better, if it's helping us make things that are novel and never been done before, it helps open up new ideas. I don't really necessarily see the problem with it. And I, I mean, the people who sell our work and people who buy it are not having to say it. And I find often that the fact that it's some sort of new or novel technology usually helps provide cultural significance and context for those pieces. Because, um, you know, then we're experimenting with new techniques in a lot of these cases, um, which provides another level of value for the object. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's not, I haven't seen it to be a hindrance at all. You know, um, we have a fab lab now at Haystack, which is the Mountain School of Craft, which has traditionally been. Uh, things crafted by hand. It's difficult to get the internet up there unless you drive to the town library. Um, and when the the group there first heard that uh, about the possibility of having a fab lab, it was met with a lot of resistance. Why do we need this? You know, 3D printing or you know CNC routing and laser cutting. Um, I happened to go up and work in the lab with traditional artists when it was in its second year. And it was amazing the way it was uh, embraced and the degree of experimentation and the way that they um, were very seamlessly and, and avidly incorporating it, even if, if it was just a prototype and an experiment. So um, I think anything that, I mean, when you, I mean if, if you look at it in that context, at one point the anvil was new technology, you know. Um, so uh, I think that it's wonderful that it's an option and Artists are in the business of defying expectations. Who, why do we care if somebody thinks X, Y, Z of it? Unless you're in business and you're producing a product and you know you're, you have a market. But I think um, artists do have a market. I, I know. But what I'm saying is, in the process of exploring ideas, um, it's, it's you know I think it's uh, 
a, a wonderful avenue, and I think a lot of artists are curious and embracing it. Do you want to respond? Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just funny. I mean, I think. It's always, it's always like kind of a sore subject, the idea that, that artists don't have a market or don't have to be responsible for those things. And I, I find that's actually, if we do run into any problem with using technology or question about the technology we're using, the, the subject of ubiquity is a problem, right? Because, you know, we're dealing with, with digital files. We're dealing with things that are potentially infinitely replicable at a low cost, or and at some point, maybe even more so than they are right now. So, and, and honestly, like, looking at it objectively, I feel very often when we produce those kinds of pieces, we're making a commodity in many ways. Um, so, you know, the idea of, it, of that commodity being digital is, is a bit of a question, and it, and it always has been for me. Um, and we do work a lot with, with luxury brands, and, and we've done things where we would have stuff generate themselves once on the website and go away forever, and make sure certain parameters never exist again. Um, in a kind of effort to produce exclusivity or scarcity. Because um, I think that's a, that's a factor that we really can't ignore when we're talking about art. I mean, people have bought photographic prints, you know, without owning the negative um, as fine art, you know, for, for a long time. That's very established um, conventions around that kind of thing. And usually it's, there's a, you know, it's a limited edition, so it's not just, it's not going to the shelves at Target or Bed Bath & Beyond, right? It's a, it, there, there are going to be 15 of them um, made. One of the interesting things that, uh, and I don't know a ton about this, but that I have been watching a little bit is, obviously 3D printing raises you know, all sorts of intellectual property challenges and, and questions and, and issues that we're going to have to resolve. But, um, but there are um, companies, for example, that are using, uh, there's a company I know based in, in, in New York, and I'm liking on their name, but um, they're using the blockchain, which is the sort of underlying um, technology under Bitcoin, to essentially track the ownership of a digital work, right? And you can sell it, and it can't be duplicated beyond what's been authorized by the, you know, the original um, owner. So there's there are ways of solving those problems, um, and, and people are doing some some interesting stuff in that front. Now we have many members of the 3D printing community in this audience, so I'm really interested to learn your thoughts on what the 3D printing community ought to do to remain relevant and to become more relevant to artists in the arts community. Anyone? Making more tools. <laughs> Keep making more tools? Yeah. We'll dig into that, I'm interested. Um. No, I think earlier we were talking about like cost and accessibility of 3D printing. I think one of the biggest things that have changed my practice, the first print that we ever made was, it was big, it was a $30,000 print. Um, if I go back now and I try to recreate that same piece, you know, we would get all the machines we needed to do that for that price and all the material <laughs> and, you know, like it would, I would have had like a, I would have had a whole lab lab for that. Thing. So, like, I mean, I think what we're enabled to do now, like the diversity of tools that we have in the studio now, and even though we don't use all of those as final production pieces, and we still might send pieces out, um, it, it's enabled a level of experimentation that we couldn't have before. Because a lot of these machines, um, especially the ones that are more open source, and like actually the desktop machines um, in particular, uh, they become like R and D platforms for us, or like development kits, um, so we can try out things. With, without really risking very much. Um, and if something works, then we can go to someone and say, hey, we tried this on this machine, it's not that much different, can we do it here? And so it's, it's, it's really pushed innovation for us a lot. Um, so like for, for us, I mean, you know, the more open, or even if you want to produce a machine that is a completely closed ecosystem, I mean, have a version of that that's like a development platform. You know, like, like give me, it's like having like a, a software environment that's safe that, we can, that you can develop new applications in. Because um, ultimately, I mean, it's designers and, and people like us that are, that are going to be finding applications for these tools. Um, and we need a way that's, you know, you might have done a really good market research and figured out exactly like what the automotive industry needs in a printer. But like, what if we're working on a project that, that really isn't in the market yet, but it is a long-term desire? That, I mean, there's things that people are going to come up against that are in the industry that you can't anticipate. Um, and I think having having development platforms would, would really would really help secure a strong future for, for 3D printing. Yeah, I mean, technologies like 3D printing are they're already uh, developing at a kind of Moore's Law style, um, accelerating you know, return, right? 
So there's exponential growth that's happening in terms of price and performance and, and all the rest. I, it's going to take care of itself, uh, uh, honestly. I mean, artists are um, resourceful. So again, I'm going to generalize. Um, artists, <laughs> artists tend to be resourceful, um, and they tend to not have a lot of money, um, so they tend to be cost sensitive, right? Um, so great. I mean, as the price naturally falls, and, and is falling already pretty quickly, as we start being able to work with more and different kinds of materials, um, it, th there's going to be a, a real flourishing of creativity, I'm, I'm, I'm confident. And I would think, Phyllis, um, having maker spaces available to artists um, is a real key. <laughs> yeah, um, we're actually trying to develop a fellowship program where we can invite uh, creatives, we can call them artists, visual artists, uh, people from really musicians, uh, playwrights, poets, um, to invite them to come and be able to really spend, uh, you know, an adequate amount of time for them to develop studio practice at the lab, um, potentially produce a body of work, be able to show it. We have a awesome loft space for exhibitions. And uh, if they so choose, if, if they're uh, interested in collaborating with the group of fellows, great. If they want to share with the community, there's the opportunity to do that. Um, and so providing a collaborative experience and also access to the machines, uh, not just as sort of a drive-by, but really more like studio practice is what we're, we're trying to launch. So we're talking with some local artists now and if uh, anybody in this room is interested, um, feel free to be in touch. Um, well, when I first found this company in Boston, I, I approached them about sponsoring an exhibition where they would do all the printing for um, the six different artists that were coming together. So it was a perfect collaboration. They were a little hesitant at first in working with artists, but I think through the process, they also they got very excited about what was being printed on their machines that they didn't even um, have the sense could be done. And that's also driven them to try to work on, on different software as well as to um, improve the machines to do more of the things we were trying to do. So I'd say getting, working, having the, the people making machines, working with closely with the with artists and designers is, is one way to move things forward. Great. Um, I'd like to open things up to the audience for questions. Lauren. Hi, Lauren with the Shapeways Education. I have a question for you guys that sort of reflects on the IP issue that was raised briefly before, but you know, the reason that materials and uh, developments in 3D printing, industrial 3D printing specifically, are not moving at a pace that we like is largely because of patents and uh, exclusivity around technology. And we're going to see an acceleration because those patents are expiring. And I know that patents and t uh, copyright and uh, trademark are all very different things. And we have friends in the room or in the building that can go very deep into those. But um, I suppose my question is really around uh, sort of digging deeper into that question of uh, copyright and artistic individuality and the, the allure of an individual piece. Uh, I'm one of the oldest uh, digital natives, I think. Like I got an email account when I was like 12, 12 years old, that kind of thing. So to me, it doesn't seem that strange to be able to share a file. And you mentioned photography um, being a fine art practice where you can sell limited editions, but they had to fight for that. Photographers in the early 20th century had to fight for that legitimacy in the fine art world and make it a real thing by making that, falsely making that exclusivity. And now that that's no longer really possible, um, what do we do? What do we do? <laughs> well, I mean, my argument though is like, what it, is it really not possible? I mean, because I, I mean, I'm assuming you're, you're alluding to the fact that, you know, like what if someone scans the sculpture or like we saw a computer reproduce Rembrandt or something. I, I mean, you know, this, this assumes that there is some sort of tool to enable someone to replicate that infinitely. And I think, you know, when, like, I, mean, I was talking about this a lot, like just because you might have a scan of something that's injection molded, that doesn't mean it's going to be a good 3D printed part or have the same qualities or, or anything like that, right? I mean, there, 
they're kind of they're different materials, they're different tools, different processes. I think but a future wherein we have a lot of 3D printed content, then yes, because then we're gonna have we're gonna have like valuable data that can be replicated in that way. Go ahead. So there was a case that came up in the lab recently where some people came in and, and printed a 3D scan of Nefertiti's bust. I think the one in the loop. And the print is, is I did it, it was I'm not bragging. It was really, really good. It was gorgeous. Like, 0 0.06 layer high. It looked amazing. But I was thinking, like, where did this scan come from? And like, who owns the scan? Like, because somebody owns the statue. And uh, I started. They successfully sold it to yeah. a different museum to but, prove that it could be done. But what, what, <laughs> what I found when I was reading was this really good ALA paper the that was uh, lied, written for librarians that talked about uh, severability, mm -hmm. to where if you can. Uh, you can distinguish copyright or intellectual property right if you can sever the artistic value of something away from its functional value. But then also on top of that, there's the, the ownership of the digital file is different than the ownership of the actual object. So mm -hmm. that the owner of the statue can claim ownership of the statue but couldn't claim ownership of the actual scan of the digital file. Right. Well, so, this, this largely depends on what the value is. I mean, if it's a trademark or something like if it's the image of the thing like Mickey Mouse, right, right that's something else. But, yeah. but people have been selling, successfully selling counterfeit art for hundreds of years. <laughs> this is not new to 3D printing. <laughs> Um, or, or digital technology even, right? So I, I guess I tend to be pretty um, blase about this actually. And, and I, if you look at you know, the early days of file sharing and music and, and things, you know, if you set up, if, if you are convinced that your customers are, are stealing your things from you and you set up you know, sort of an antagonistic relationship and you sue them and all this kind of stuff, like that doesn't work. You, you're going to lose. Um, but what we saw was that if you make it relatively easy and, and sort of at a fair price to buy the content that you want, people will pay for it. Because most people are honest. Most, most people are not trying to, to scam you. They just don't like being treated like criminals when, when they're not. So I, I think you know, there, there are like sort of behavioral economic answers to a lot of this stuff. Also, like, I mean, if you're getting knocked off like that, I mean, I, I long for the day that I walk down Canal Street and see a knockoff handbag or something that design, because that, that means, like, you're, you're, there's a desire for this thing, right? It's, it's a You've signifier. Made it. that, right? and, you know, and the people buying those knockoff bags are not the people buying, like, a, you know, that other piece. So, like, it's a different kind of customer, and I, I think, if anything, it's an indicator of success. Right? The, the point of the number TV scan was to return to the country of origin a copy of the object, not to steal the object for commercial purposes. So the artist, that's the reason why they said they did that. Um, they also lied, they actually stole the digital file and didn't create it themselves. That's, a, that's another issue. But their issue was to decolonize. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and, and the busk itself might actually be fake. Um, so. <laughs> but an old thing. An old thing. So but their idea was to de decolonize intellectual property or decolonize something that had been taken from the country of Okay. Thanks for clarifying that, Bernard. Let's go to you right here. So I just want to go kind of back to the education component. Um, one of the things I've been kind of having discussions about is with you know a craft you have an objective. You have to get to the objective and there's steps to take the objective. And then with making, you actually have a goal you have to reach, and the way you reach that goal can be any number of ways. And so how do you measure you know, success in terms of getting to an objective with a craft versus with making? Because a lot of times I'm hearing, you know, with these 3D printers, the reason why they're, there's a 3D printer uh, called a Wasp that can actually print with ceramic. It can actually make, you know, but, but that will be, you know, kind of deterred because there's no way to really measure success because there's no technique there's no, no, I don't think that's true at all. You don't think so? No, I mean we've done some ceramic printing, and I would definitely still say there's a technique there. Um, I mean, you still have to you have to set up your settings, you have to program your printer. In a lot of cases, like a lot of things we do, we don't even have to make software to do what we're trying to do. Or, you know, I, I think there's very if you want to achieve any effects that are that are going to be like really desirable, I, I find it is very much a craft. This is what Kate does, right? Yeah, this is what Kate does. Yeah. Let's yeah. hear from Kate. <laughs> Well, I, I do think that the material, that some understanding of what the, the inherent qualities of the material are important. Um, but again, with my RISD students, and this, with, with the project I worked in, it's a, it's a ceramic production class. They're learning all aspects of the material, but 
I did a, this 3D printing project with them at the very beginning before they really knew about the material, but they knew how to design things. And there's always a, a back and forth when you don't know the material and don't understand what it, it does. So I think, again, with everything, there you, you do need some knowledge of what your what the material is that you're working with. But and then again, for it to 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 be successful is use it, use the tool. It's, you know, just like you'd use the wheel, you can make the pottery and the wheel to make a certain type of thing if you want symmetry. So that's, you go to that tool or slip casting or, but the 3D printing can do things you can't do any other way, but you still have to know that it's going to be subject to 2,000 degrees heat and it's going to, you know, wall thicknesses have to be a certain thing in it and there's material properties that are different than plastic that are different than metal. Go ahead. Um, just to follow up on that, I guess I'm curious to hear from you and Phyllis and Francis, um, and, and obviously you too, Adam, if you have insight into this, um, whether, whether 3D um, processes are fundamentally changing the artistic process. I don't mean by just adding new mat materials and new tools or even new ways of doing things, but I'm kind of thinking, you know, analogous to the way the internet has really transformed communication, and um, arguably, you know, uh, the way young artists, in particular contem contemporary artists, uh, music artists, think about approaching their craft and their work, where, you know, before reproduction, the only way you could make money as a, as a musician or a performer was live. Then you had albums and all of that, and we're now kind of now. We've, it's almost as though we've come full circle because artists, independent artists, especially, are giving away their music for free and making their money off of performance. And, I, and again, I don't really just want to limit it to the economic, but to the real artistic process. Like, is there a fundamental change there? Um. <laughs> it's a loaded question. Yeah, I, mean, I don't. I mean, for me, it's the only process I've ever known. So I, I don't know if I can say if there's a change or, or not. Um, I've just always worked that way. I actually never really, I was an art major in, like originally in college. I, I was terrible, I can't draw, I can't really, I can't, can't sculpt. Um, but I could code. And I mean, that was, <laughs> so like that was just the way I kind of found I could best express myself. Um, but so I don't, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure they probably have more to say coming from a traditional studio background. Uh, yes, I would say yes. There's a fundamental difference. I think it's expanding our visual language. I mean, there are things that you see that that you wouldn't have seen ten years ago that are being made. So that it's that in that way it is, and it's it's it's, it's expanding the way that we actually create. Um, it's a new way. It's it's when you're working with a computer as opposed to when you're working by hand. I don't I try not to say which one is better. I just think that we're seeing different things, and that's because of the process. Let's go back there. Yeah. Um, so I kind of want to go back to a topic that we uh, touched on earlier about the, the artist's relationship to technology. And I, I would kind of disagree with what seemed to be the characterization of artists not really uh, embracing the technology so much themselves. I think artists have for, uh, for uh, throughout all of history, whether that's metal casting or you know, early access to video cameras and how that like, video art was like the whole thing. And, and, and there were early involvements in those things. Um, I, I feel like there was sort of a lull maybe in like the, <coughs> like in the 80s and 90s uh, and in the early 2000s where, where there wasn't as much direct in involvement and I think that in some ways uh, artists sort of ceded innovation to technologists in some ways and, and they, they weren't really intimately connected. But, and, and I think that, that that does relate a lot to the academy at that point. But I think that there's been a, a, a huge catch up lately, I, I can at least say for the institution where I am, and there's been a, a major like, capital investment in getting this technology at the hands of these students. And, and they, they take to the, you, you put those tools in their hands and they take to it very quickly and, and very eagerly. Um, to me, where I see that we don't have the same level of capital investment is uh, both on the, is more on the market side. Um, you know, there, there isn't that, you know, every other sector, like there's massive investment in, in technology. Any, anybody that has anything to do with uh, innovative technology, like there's just money funneled into that. Like here, like in the arts, like 
there's money funneled into painting. Over like painting and painting. It's like in the it's older the painting, the more money. <laughs> yeah. What's that? Let's get over yourself. Right, right. Um, so I guess uh, from somebody who's involved in funding with the arts and somebody who is like it seems like making a, a, a practice in this sort of hybrid space. Um, and again, I think the institutions, art institutions, are are really embracing this hybridity as well. Um, I, I'd just like to hear you guys' thoughts on, on how we can sort of make uh, our, our culture more sort of receptive and supportive, and so we, the artists can have this meaningful role in the development of these technologies. I couldn't hear your last. Was the last oh, <coughs> I'd like to hear uh, people's uh, thoughts on how. <coughs> What we can do culturally and maybe politically or economically to uh, to keep artists engaged in the development of this, these technologies. How can we uh, provide that support? Artists find a way, and when you know that's part of the adventure of it. I don't. I, I mean, not all artists think alike. There are artists I know who can visualize in their head 3D and turn it and then just build it at, in an analog uh, studio. And, and it's amazing. I, my process is different. I have to fumble and stumble with the physical stuff until it feels just right. Um, these processes, I don't think are that, it depends on what your process is. Clearly, if you look at Jonathan Moynihan's work, he's working with digital modeling and one could consider that the definition of art is making real an idea, a perception, or a feeling, whether the medium be music or something physical, art, design. Um, and so this, these processes, if you can't turn it in your head and make it, you can now learn modeling and do that on the screen. That doesn't always translate to how it comes out on a 3D printer, but you're you're getting closer to taking an experience and materializing it. Um, anybody who's worked with 3D printing knows that it's not yet the Star Trek replicator. The machines have challenges. The software has challenges. It's it's not direct and perfect, but it's, it's fun to play with, at least from my perspective, and I like to see how artists are taking it further and further for their, for their own use and exploration. And um, I think, to your point, Ryan, um, Micah is an outstanding example of making these resources available. I think more and more schools, whether they be, uh, and this is part of the realm that we work in, whether they be public schools, independent schools, community college, and university, with the efforts of the administration, efforts with organizations like Fractured Atlas, with all that our policymakers are doing, it's the thing now. Everybody wants to figure out how to get this in people's hands and see what they'll do with it in the, in the name of innovation. And yeah, I, mean, I think from the education perspective, though, I think the worst thing about what my education was is like, you know, when, you're, when you're an artist or you take that as like your course of study, that you don't really get a lot of exposure to the sciences. You don't get a lot yeah. of exposure to, and like you're, you know, you're, you're working with materials that are chemicals. Like you're working with, like you don't really get the same depth of information that an engineering student might get, just like they don't get the same depth of humanity education that an artist might get. And I think, I don't know, I've, I've always found it very problematic the way we break people down into these categories, because then when you grow up in life, and then they might end up as like a client of ours or something, and then they think, well, I don't have to be good at this, I don't have to know that, I don't have to know business, I don't have to, because I'm an artist. And I don't, I don't think it's like a, a catch-all to not be good at other things or have an understanding or appreciation of other things. We'll do one final question right here. Yeah, it's just um, kind of continuing on this topic uh, of you know, connecting artists to technologists, uh, particularly within a school and uh, university context. There's an organization that some of you who are interested in this topic of that intersection uh, might be interested in. Um, it's got a terrible name. It's called uh, the Alliance for Arts in Research Universities, or A2RU. But the whole focus of it is really about kind of communicating at the dean level at these different um, universities uh, around the country 
um, uh, to sort of encourage more collaboration and integration between different departments at the university uh, with the arts at the center of that. Um, and so uh, I'm not exactly sure kind of like what, I, I, I only have limited familiar, familiarity with the organization. I don't know what the opportunities are to plug in, but it's, um, uh, again, for people who are interested in this space, it's one to be aware of. Okay. Well, certainly this is a topic that we could talk about for hours. However, we only have this room reserved for a number of minutes, so we're going to have to wrap it up. But I'd like to thank my <coughs> panelists today very much. If you will indulge me, uh, it's really important that we show our gratitude to our sponsors, the Congressional Maker Caucus and the rest of the <laughs>